hello again, friends, and welcome to our online church service here at Russia Gornish Church. And whether you're a regular with us or you're finding us here for the first time, uh, we're really glad that you just made the choice to uh, spend these few minutes with us here today. And, and we also trust that God will use our time together to encourage you in your own journey of faith. And as we look into God's Word now, like we do every week when we come together, we're going to be picking up in a series of talks that we started last week called Lighting the Lamp. And it's actually a series from the book of Revelation in the Bible, where the very, in the very first chapter, the Apostle John is doing his best to describe a vision that God gave to him while he was living as a prisoner in exile on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. And uh, one of the things I was saying last week, because the book of Revelation has a bit of a reputation for being hard to understand, is that trying to describe a vision is kind of like trying to tell people about the dream you had last night. Like, it's not always easy, right? And so in our series, we're going to try and be patient with John through some of the confusing bits. But one of the more interesting parts of John's vision, and a part that isn't really so confusing because it comes with its own explanation, is found in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 1, where he writes about his vision, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man, who, among other things, held seven stars in his right hand. Basically, he's saying he saw Jesus after he'd been raised from the dead and gone back up into heaven. And, and he's standing there with the, the light of seven stars in his hand, like this incredible bright light, while being surrounded by all of these lampstands. Do you follow that? Like, that's act, the actual vision. That's what he saw. And then a little later on, we read the explanation for what he saw in verse 20. This is God's response to John. John's, God says this to John. He says, this is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And by the way, the seven churches he's talking about here are actually seven literal, local, historic churches who were probably not unlike our own church in a lot of ways, apart from the fact that they were active in a different era. Uh, like, we didn't read this part today, but he actually lists the churches earlier. He, they were all first century churches uh, in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Interestingly, they were all kind of neighbors, not very many, not very much distance between them on the mainland, just off the, uh, on the coast of where John was living in exile. And so that, that's the big lasting image from Revelation 1. Jesus is standing in the middle of these seven lampstands, or these seven churches, and with him are seven angels or messengers that he's about to release and send out to each of the churches with a message to help them keep their lampstands lit so that they can shine God's light into the communities where he's called them to serve. That's why our series is called Lighting the Lamp. God is all about using his people to shine his light. And as we move into chapter 2 this week, we start to see the unique personalized messages that God sends through his messengers, the angels, to each of these seven churches, beginning here today with the church at Ephesus. Uh, understanding, of course, that if God had a message for those early believers back in John's day, he most certainly will have a message for us in our own day and age as well. So as we're listening to these messages, we all have, have to have our uh, ears ready to hear what God is saying to us. And so this is from Revelation 2, beginning with verse 1. God says to John, write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. It's from Jesus. I know all the things you do, and I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say that they're apostles and are not. You've discovered they are liars. You've, you've patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me. Do the works you did at first. And if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. Uh, you hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. 
And anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who's victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. When you think about Jesus uh, standing in the middle of the lampstands and he's sending out messengers to each of the seven churches, this is the one he sent to the first church, the church at Ephesus. And it's kind of a mixed message, or it sounds that way, doesn't it? Like my parents used to, uh, used to get those kinds of messages in the report cards I brought home from school. It would be something like, oh, you know, he's a bright boy. He's, he's doing well in all of his subjects, but he won't sit still or, or maybe he interrupts a lot. Um, do you remember when the, the classrooms all had the big industrial pencil sharpeners on the wall, big steel sharpeners? I, well, I, I seem to remember a note coming home in one of my report cards uh, one time that, that I wouldn't leave the pencil sharpener alone. You know, it had to be bad, right, for it to go in a report card. For, like for a while there, every pencil I had, I would sharpen it right down until it was just a stub with an eraser on the end. I was fascinated by it. Well, the message to the Church of Ephesus was a bit of a mixed report card, too. It starts out great at the beginning. Like God says to them, listen, I've noticed all the good things you're doing. You're working hard. You're hanging tough. Uh, you kind of showed a knack of resilience for staying on track with things. Uh, you're able to kind of discern who the good leaders are and who they're not. Like the difference between right and wrong. Your moral compass is fully intact. And as the good folk of First Church Ephesus are reading that, I can imagine they're thinking, well, that all sounds pretty good. Like it all sounds like everything we're doing is great because we have been working hard and we have been staying on track. And it's not always easy. I mean, Ephesus is a pretty busy spot and, and there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of ungodly stuff going on around here. But, but we've been doing our best to stay on the straight and narrow. Thank you, God. Thanks for noticing. See, what you, what you might not know about Ephesus in those days is that as a community, it was probably the largest and most influential center for conducting business in all of Western Asia Minor. For starters, it was a port city. And as a port city, it was often the first stopping place for traders who were coming by ship from the east. You know, we have our own uh, port city here in New Brunswick in, in St. John. And, and I, I, I enjoy St. John. Like, I like to go to the Sea Dogs games in St. John. They've got some great coastal trails in St. John that I enjoy. Uh, they've got some great places to eat in St. John. They've worked really hard to brighten up the waterfront in recent years. I enjoy that. But listen, have you ever tried driving around in that city? Like, it's crazy sometimes, isn't it? With all the twisty roads and, and up and down and blind hills and one-way streets or two-way streets that are so narrow, they should be one-way streets. It's almost like back in the day, they didn't really plan anything. They just cut roads wherever they needed to. And that's the way it was with a lot of port cities, actually, because because of their strategic importance, they just kind of blew up. They grew so quickly in both population and enterprise that they just, they just grew in all directions. And I mean, go to Halifax or go to St. John's, Newfoundland, or pretty much any other major port, and you'll find that it's kind of the same. It's, it's actually part of their charm, even if it makes it hard to navigate at times. Well, Ephesus was a port city too. It was busy. And because it was busy, it was growing. In its heyday, it was the place to go in the region when you needed to get things that you couldn't get anywhere else. But the other thing that was true about Ephesus was that in addition to it being kind of the, the epicenter for trade and commerce and those kinds of things, was that it was also a prominent and well-known religious center which means it was a home for all kinds of religious types, both the traditional and the non-traditional, like the normal ones and the crazy one. When you live in a big city, you just you attract everybody. And the most prominent of these religious groups that grew up in Ephesus was a group that worshipped a fertility goddess by the name of Artemis. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a temple to the goddess Artemis in Ephesus that was so elaborate and so lavishly put together in marble and gold and, and silver that even though there's only remnants of it now left, it's still listed as one of the seven great wonders of the world. But again, that was just the most prominent one. There were all kinds of other religious groups in Ephesus too in those days. And of course, there were always new groups splitting off of old groups and other groups that were a mixture of two or three one, uh, of them together. It was kind of like mixing paint. You can create any color you want 
if you experiment with it long enough. And so you can imagine how that would have been for the how it would have been for the Christian community, the followers of Jesus, who were still kind of new to the scene, to stay true to their faith and the message they've been given in that environment. Like the easy thing for them would be just to go with the flow, to join the buffet, so to speak. Like little of this, little of that, extra croutons, hold the tomatoes. Like that would be the easy thing. But that wasn't how it was with the Ephesian church. To their credit, they never wavered in the practice of their very practical faith. They held fast to what they believed. They didn't veer away from Jesus' teachings, get distracted by other messages. Like even when they were pressured or, or even persecuted for their faith, and they were, they were absolutely resolute in their commitment to it. And it doesn't escape God's attention. Like he recognizes them for it. Well done, church. I've seen how strong you've been in the face of it all. And it's impressive. You haven't entertained teaching from, from people that, who, who want to lead you in a different direction. You haven't fallen prey to worldly thinking just because it's popular. You haven't allowed the message of Jesus to become watered down in any way. Good for you. Congratulations. And as they're reading the letter from John, I can only imagine the members of the Ephesian church were thinking, that's right. Good for us. Congratulations to us. After all, if what they believed was right and their behavior was right and the message to the community was right and that was affirmed for them by God himself, then what could possibly be wrong, right? And then they unroll the scroll a little bit further and they read next one word that for us is found at the beginning of verse four in the scriptures. Can you guess what it is? It's the word but. And you know it can't be good when you're getting praise heaped on you and you're feeling good about it, but then you hear the word, but. But, God says, I have this complaint against you. And they were like, no, God. Like, what do you mean you have a complaint against us? How could you possibly have a complaint against us? Have you seen us? Have you met us? We've been talking about us. But I have this complaint against you, the Lord says. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And there's the complaint. You've been busy. You've been doing good things. You've been saying good things. You've been being good people. And everybody notices that. Like, I've noticed that. I've been impressed by it. But listen, listen. I miss you. That's really the message from God to this church. In all of your doing and saying and being, the one thing that you've forgotten about is me. You don't love me as much as you did at first. You've walked away from your first love. And you might not have noticed, but it's spilled over into your other relationships with one another as well. Like the external stuff is great, but the inside, it needs some work. You know, last week I, I mentioned that we were going to start looking at these messages written specifically to seven historic churches, but that we might in moments see ourselves in various places. And given all the experience of those who are hearing this message here today, I, I'm wondering, do the Lord's words to this historic church in Ephesus hit home in any way with any of us? Because it can happen so subtly, can't it? So gradually that we don't even notice it happening for a while and certainly other people might not notice it at first either because we can still look the same on the outside God's addressing a church in general but but it has an individual application as well like we still go to church we still sing the songs we, we still serve where we've always served we still sit in the same seat like people see us the same and listen we still believe what we've always believed and we behave like we have behaved for the most part. We haven't wa wavered from the truth in that way. But there are some of us for whom the biggest difference between where we were and where we are now, because that's, there's always movement with faith. If we're not increasing, we're decreasing. There are some of us for whom the biggest difference between where we once were and where we are now is that our actual relationship with God, if we're completely honest, has grown a bit more distant. 
it's grown a bit more distance. So, you know, our Bible doesn't get touched anymore from one week to the next. It used to, but now not so much. Like we, we kind of feel like we know the stories. And we pray, but only when we're at church mostly, never really on our own anymore. And when we hear of, of people's problems, we sympathize with that. But, you know, we have our own problems and it doesn't really cross our minds to actually take time to pray to God on their behalf. In fact, we kind of forget what it's like to see a direct answer to prayer. And worship becomes less worshipful and church just another thing on the list. Like, I wonder if anyone knows what I'm talking about. And if it sounds a little like I know what I'm talking about, it's only because I've been there too. Like, nobody's immune. And if we believe what God is saying to the church in Ephesus, apparently, it's a condition that can actually spread like a virus across and throughout an entire church given enough time. Because, you know, and it makes sense, we're the ones that are supposed to be helping one another, right? Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And so if we started putting our relationship with God in the margins of our lives, then there are two or three other people, perhaps maybe more even, that we're no longer sharpening. And then they stop growing too, and they stop sharpening their friends. And in time, completely unintentionally, and without anyone even really noticing, again, that's the key to this, you're left with a church that is still technically believing the same things, technically doing the same things, but without the same heart. It's all a little hollow. It's all a little shallow. It's a little bit more emotionless. And if it's left, left to go a little bit longer, it starts to morph again and it, it can become uh, something entirely different. It, become, it can become graceless and merciless. And sometimes there's infighting and sometimes pettiness becomes a thing and a critical spirit finds its way into the fellowship. And this isn't an indictment really. I don't want anybody to think that this is our report card here at our church. This is the report card of the church at Ephesus. But it's something that can and does happen in churches in every generation who lose sight of their first love. And taken far enough, when it begins to really set in, what's left is a church that is no longer attractive to the community it's trying to reach because the light of Christ can no longer be seen. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if I could speak with all the languages of earth and of angels, and if I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, all of those things, if I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, I could brag about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained what? Nothing. One of my personal life quotes is by a 13th century mystic named Mathilde of Magdeburg, who said, simple love with even but little knowledge can do great things. I have, a, the, I have this complaint against you, God told the Ephesians. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And so if that's the condition, then what's the prescription? How do you heal a church that has forgotten its first love? Or maybe to take it even a step further back, how do you heal a heart that's forgotten its first love? Well, listen to what God says again from our text, because in his message to the Ephesian church, he actually outlines for us a pretty clear three-step process. And it's not an easy process or a quick process necessarily. Uh, for most people, they didn't get to the place where they've, got, they've, got, they've forgotten their love for God overnight, and so they might not get back to it overnight either. But the process at least is a clear one. It's really just this, look, turn, and do the works you did at first. Look how far you've fallen, God says. In other words, take some personal inventory. That's the first piece. You may not have noticed what's been going on, but stop up for a minute. Do you, like, do you remember a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are right now? Do you remember when his word actually informed the choices you're making in life, that you weren't just making them on your own according to what you were thinking in the day. Do you remember celebrating answers to prayer and sharing them with other people? Do you remember that? Like, look how far you've fallen. And by fallen, it means fallen away. You can't heal what you can't acknowledge. So that's the first step. Then secondly, turn. Turn back to me, God says. And this is the hard part, but it's, the, it's an act of the will and it has 
more to do with attitude than it does with behavior. This is the place where you come to God and you say to him, you know what, I, I miss you too. I'm sorry for what's happened in our relationship. I'm sorry for how far I've fallen. And friends, listen, you can't skip this step and think for a minute that things are going to turn around for you. There's no restoration without repentance. And it might not come easily either. Not everybody can just decide in a day that, that they're going to heal what's broken. And of course, we can't heal ourselves anyway. We need the Lord to do that for us. But God will meet you where you are and he'll lead you to the place of turning if you really want it to happen. And then finally, the behavior then comes into play. The third piece is do the works you did at first. And this is where so many people miss the mark because we always want to start with this. Like maybe if I just do this or I do this other thing or I read this or I volunteer for that, maybe that's going to do it for me. And it's part of the process and it won't hurt you to do it first. But in terms of helping, helping you get back to loving God the way you should, it needs to come after you've already evaluated your life and turned your heart in the right direction. And that's the process for churches too. And it's critical. God told the, Ephesians church, the Ephesian church that was doing so many things well, remember, that none of it would matter if their relationship with God was neglect, neglected. In fact, he told them that if they didn't address it, their lampstand would be removed. It's not that he would want to. In fact, it would break his heart. But friends, we've all seen it before that when a church loses sight of the most important thing and tradition begins to trump mission and personal comfort takes the place of, of a dynamic relationship with God that challenges us and stretches us and calls us to greater vision and deeper service, and that goes on long enough, then the churches for whom the light has gone but might need to give way, they might need to give way to a new fellowship of believers whose lamp is lit and who are ready to reach the people they're called to reach. Friends, I don't ever want to be that to be a church that I'm involved in. Like, I don't ever want to be guilty, so guilty of being busy with church activity that I my, that my first love for God and for God's people, I've lost. And I trust you don't want to be either. And so may we always be a church that is committed to being healthy from the inside out, for whom the love of God himself is the fire that lights our lamp, and may God give us the impact for the kingdom of the communities that he's called us to impact. Let's pray uh, to him as we close. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your message to the church at, at Ephesus in the first century. And thank you for the things that it shows and teaches churches in our own generation here today. And God, we take it to heart. We understand what you're saying. So keep us near to your heart, we pray. May our love for you be as deep and wide as your love for us. And may the light that you have given to us be a community, uh, as a community of believers here, shine bright for all to see so that those who are outside of the family of God might ultimately be drawn to you and give their lives to you and secure their eternity with you, which of course is your perfect will. And we will be careful to praise you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us again this week, and uh, we'll hope to see you next time for another of God's messages to the churches of the book of Revelation. Bye for now.